Hey church, it is so great to have you with us online today. And we really believe church is community. It's not just something that we attend, but actually it's something that we belong in. And we believe in belonging here at Life Church. So you belong here. And one way that you can help create a great community is through life groups. And so we've got so many life groups that you can look at that there's sure to be one in your local location that you can connect with some like-minded people, uh, read the Bible together, encourage each other in your faith, and also have a whole lot of fun. Um, so check out life groups today on the QR code. You can get them there. You can also see more information about our locations. You can uh, reach out to get connected. Lots of things. Everything you need is in that QR code. So scan it today. That's awesome. And hey, like JB said, church, we are a family and we are praying for you. We are praying that you can get connected in community and we're also praying for God's supernatural power moving in whatever you're believing for. So why don't we pray and agree together right now for God's power moving in your life. Father, I thank you for every single person that is joining in today. Father, you know the desires of their heart. And I pray right now that they would sense your presence and that you would move powerfully and we would hear testimonies of how good and faithful our God is. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey church, let's get ready to worship together. Let's get ready to take notes in the message and make sure you reach out and let us know how we can be connecting and praying with you. Come on, let's worship.
I'll stop all my striving And I'll come out of hiding See that Your feet I bow down before you Surrendering my life again In the middle In the middle of the madness I know that you were ever Close to me So I'm coming back Back to my father Christmas time. I find Christmas very intimidating. 
Anyway, that's just my personal thing. I've just been very transparent here. Best thing is, if you buy an expensive present, leave the price tag on. <laughs> if it's a cheap present, take that sucker off. And um, better still, find an expensive price tag, put it on your cheap present. <laughs> that's what you want. What you want is kudos. And uh, Christmas is all about kudos. So that's just a little bit of a hint there. But um, it is, it's Christmas time. Christmas box is so much fun. It's not a competition. We end up with three rows. It's like a production line of stacking, packing boxes. And you might be the CC girl and you just do the CCs. That's all you'll have to do. You have to think too laterally. Um, we get some destructive boys to rip the boxes apart and take them outside and dive on top of them and all of that sort of stuff. It's the best time ever. First, not last year, but the year before, my team won, although it's not a competition. And last year, we came second. I think it was helped by me stealing a few boxes off the pallet of the team at the back there, just at the end, so we got one more complete pallet. But you want to come. It's the best time. But, um, it, yeah, Christmas is a great time to connect with people. I love what Jazzy shared before. Um, everyone loves what Jazzy does. She's just a nice person, isn't she, really? Some people are just too nice. She's one of those. And... Um, <laughs> But it's a great time to connect with people. And it is a great time to invite people. And, you know, I'm trying to think how I can get some of the people around my world. And, well, first thing, I've just got to ask them, but how can I get connected? You know, how can we make that point? Get some people in the room just to break down some walls, just to make it so they've been around the Jesus thing. And um, uh, it's, it's a tremendous opportunity because a lot of our people out there a lot of our mates don't know anything about Jesus. And what they've heard, they've, they got from the project or something, which is probably not reliable. And uh, that's a bit of a life lesson right there, just about everything. But um, how, how do we connect with people? You know when you're connecting with... Have you ever looked around a coffee shop, sit in a coffee shop? I, I think like this, and I look at the coffee shop, and I think, how many people here know Jesus? It's very confronting to think of that. And you look at your mates, and you think, how many people know Jesus? And what's the implications of not knowing Jesus. And so if I know to connect with people, I need to build some sort of, there needs to be something that we connect with. And you know, one great way you can connect with people, you think, oh, I've got nothing in common. Yes, you do. Be interested in them because I promise you, they're interested in them. And so if, if you can have a shared interest right there, them, and uh, just ask them what they're into and talk about what they're into, and then you're both interested in something the same, them. And uh, it, it just, it's, it's not rocket science. That's what Jesus did. It, it astonishes me that Jesus came looking for people. Um, he was always hanging out with people. He never thought he was better than people. And if anyone was better than people, it's Jesus, right? And he was just came looking for Jesus, looking for people. And, and, and it, you know, he even said it. He met this guy called Zacchaeus and he said, look, here's the reason I've come is to seek and to save lost people. It, 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 the, the thing that Jesus was about was lost people. People And he was always in trouble for hanging out with people from the religious leaders, which showed that the religious leaders didn't really know who he was. They didn't understand who Jesus was. And because they didn't understand who Jesus was, they didn't understand what he loved. And because they didn't understand what he loved, they didn't understand what he was doing. And so they thought that God was all about judging people. Um, and, and so they tried to keep themselves away from anyone who was more sinful than them, which was precisely the wrong thing to be doing. And, 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 and so Jesus was always in trouble for not staying away from people. And, and, and these people would often come to him and say, look, you're hanging out with sinners. And he goes, yeah, that's why he came. If Jesus didn't want to hang out with sinful people, he would have just stayed in heaven. Now, he didn't come here to earn heaven. He already had heaven. He put that on hold to come looking for people, normal people. Busted people, complicated people, like we all are. We might get better at pretending that we're not. I was watching my one-year-old grandson, if you were aware, I'm a grandfather, and he, was, he doesn't hide nothing. He's just, if he wants to scream, he'll just scream. And uh, he doesn't feel intimidated by the fact that his nana's trying to... <laughs> ah! I call him Terry when he does that, short for Terry Dactyl. But um, <laughs> he, Jesus just unashamedly looked for people. And this month, we're talking about connecting with our mates. Um, why? Because I want to encourage us to be connecting with our mates at Christmas time, which is a great time to be connecting with our mates, our family, yeah. uh, people who are not walking with Jesus today. You know, to love Jesus, I really need to know who he is. I need to love what he loves. 
and I need to do what he do, what he does, <laughs> does. Jesus was always in trouble for hanging out with people. Look at this in Luke 15. Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and even eats with them. And he spoke a parable to them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And he comes home and he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, I've found my sheep which was lost. And I say to you, likewise, there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 just persons who need no repentance. Well, we all need repentance. Um, just the thought. And, you know, we need to remember that we're not just forgiven. We are being forgiven. This is, <laughs> oh, I was forgiven years ago and yesterday and like last minute and next minute. And we need to realise that. But Jesus actually, he's confronted by these guys. They come up and say, why are you hanging out with people? So he told three stories on the trot. He told the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And uh, he didn't even draw breath. He didn't wait. But remember who he's talking to. He's talking to the religious leaders. He's talking to the people who don't think this makes sense. And he makes a point, and he gets everyone nodding. He's a great negotiator. He gets everyone nodding. Which of you, if you'd lost a sheep, wouldn't go looking? Everyone goes, yeah, that makes sense. Which of you, if you lost some money, wouldn't go looking? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, what about this lost son? See, so the religious leaders would be thinking that lost son's not worth anything. The religious leaders would think that lost son should be just pushed away. And, and Jesus said, well, if lost sheep mean something and lost money means something, then surely lost people mean more. And if we love Jesus, we need to know who he is. We need to love what he loves and do what he does. You know, the last story told was the prodigal son. And we tell the story. The, the story is pretty graphic, okay? So there's two boys, brothers. There's an older brother and there's a younger brother. And they're working for their dad. And the younger brother, he says to his dad, look, dad, you're pretty fit and you're pretty capable. And I think it's going to be a long time till you die. Can I have my inheritance now? Now, that's the most obnoxious thing for a son to say. And in that culture even more obnoxious than in our culture. He had dishonoured his father absolutely. What he deserved was just to be sent away with no inheritance and be disinherited from the family. That's what would happen there. But his dad divides his estate and gives half to his younger brother. His younger brother does not earn, does not deserve, even if he was a good younger brother, half the estate because the older brother always got more. And so he goes off and he wastes all this money on... What well, prodigal living, which is where we get the word prodigal son, which just means unwise, stupid, partying nonsense. Okay, so he wastes all his money. Then a famine comes, he finds himself with no money, and with no money, no friends. And so he's desperate. He finds himself feeding pigs. It says he joined himself to a landowner and fed his pigs, which means he didn't even, he just sort of made a job happen. Now, understand Jews and pigs, they weren't like great friends. Okay, so the Jewish people, this is, Jesus is saying he's got the worst of the worst. So the religious leaders would be listening to this and going, I'm not sure about that lost sheep story. And I'm a bit vague. Yeah, the money one makes a lot of sense. But this one, this is awesome. This son, this tax collector and all those people, he's getting the worst thing. He gets what he deserves. And they're, they're going, oh, yeah, yeah, I like this story. And so they're all in there with Jesus. They're thinking at last Jesus is saying something that makes sense. Someone gets to feed pigs. And so then, but the boy comes to his senses. And he goes, you know what? This is not great. I'm sitting here amongst the pigs, feeding them stuff. I wish I could eat the food that I'm feeding the pigs. Now, can you think of anything worse? I like watching those shows where they make them eat disgusting things. You know, they have to eat you know, a bowl full of beetles or something. And I just think it's fantastic because I'm not having to do it, right? And uh, they do it on the amazing race. They sort of have to sit there and eat, you know, ox eyeballs or something like that. And, and it's just like, you think, that's awesome because it's not me. And so, but he's so hungry, he wants to eat the pig food. And he thinks, this is not great because my dad's employees don't have to eat pig food. I'm going to go back and I'm going to strike up a deal with my dad. And I'm going to say, look... Dad, I'm really sorry. I've sinned against you and I've sinned against God and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Can you just give me a job? So he gets himself together and he journeys home and, and when he's a long way from home, his 
dad sees him, his dad comes running to see him. Middle Eastern men then and probably now just don't run. It's just undignified. His dad runs to him. In one version it says, fell on his neck. I think that's hilarious. But anyway, he gives him a big hug, all right? And he says, and, it, and the son starts his spiel. Dad, I've sinned against heaven and against, I've sinned against you and against God. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he hasn't even got to the end of it. And his, son just, his dad just interrupts him. And he calls his servants and says, get this guy a new coat. Now, a new coat always represents righteousness in the Bible. Stinking old, sinful, pig-smelling stuff. Get rid of that. Give him a new coat. Put a ring on his finger. That reinstates him. So his, his, his righteousness is restated. His, his ring, that's the family ring. That means he can transact. That's his status renewed. And give him new shoes. Shoes always represented his role in life. It's what we do. It's our strength. And so he gives him back his position in the world. So he's got righteous, he's, he's got authority, and he's got stuff to do. And, and so then he has a big party. And then the older brother comes home and he's ticked off. You read all of this in Luke 15. And the older brother comes in and he's ticked off. He won't come into the party. So the dad goes out and begs him. It says, he begged his son, please come in. And he goes, this son of yours has gone away and wasted your money on prostitutes and disgusting living. And you kill a fatted calf all these years I've been slaving for you and you never once gave me even a goat. And so he refuses to come in. And his dad says again, but your brother who was dead is alive again. You've got to come and celebrate with us. <coughs> Understand that conversation is what this whole story is about. Jesus was not talking to the tax collectors and other notorious sinners. He was talking to, responding to, the religious leaders who thought he should have been sending this guy away. What he was, who he was talking to was not the prodigal son who went away and wasted his life. It was the son who stayed. And what he was pointing out is that the son who stayed didn't know his father. He didn't love his father because he shamed his father then. That, what he did to his father then, not coming into the party was absolutely reprehensible. And he wasn't doing what his father was about. And today, we need to understand, if we want to love God, we've got to know who he is. We've got to love what he loves. And we've got to do what he does. God's calling us to know who he is, to love what he loves, and to do what he does. See, the older brother was offended at his father, all these years I've slaved for you and you never once refused, I never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do and in that time you never. He's accusing his father, you get this. This is the son shaking his finger at his father and says, you have let me down and what you're doing here is not right, it's not fair and that's what these religious leaders were saying to Jesus, this is not right, these guys do not deserve this. But that's because they think they've not made any mistakes. In another place, he says, I didn't come to call good people. I came to call people. You know, doctors don't go to, to well people. They go to people who know they're sick. Look, and the father said, look, dear son, you've always stayed with me and everything I have is yours. We have to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and now he's found. He was offended because his father was not judging his younger brother. And we can look out and we think, well, they don't deserve God. Well, no, they don't. Neither do we. <laughs> you know, uh, one time I was sort of going through a bit of a patch and some people have been a bit nasty to me and I, I, I had a really clear understanding. I don't pray that God will get them because I don't want God to start getting and decide, you know, he might like it. So I just think, if, I'd like you to forgive me, so you best forgive them. You understand what I'm saying? Imagine if I said, if I sick, you know, Jesus, get Aaron Hilton. He's been nasty to me. Well, he might, Jesus might get Aaron Hilton and go, oh, this is fun. I'm going to come after Jeff. So I don't want that. Do you want to say we're, we're all forgiven? Oh, but Aaron doesn't deserve Jesus. No, and neither. And that's what these religious guys are saying to Jesus. These guys don't deserve you. And he said, yeah, and you think you do? <laughs> he didn't understand who his father was. He didn't understand what mattered to his father. He didn't understand that he was much loved and the much forgiven son. Both of them were. 
He didn't understand the father's love. See, the, the older brother was spent all his life trying to earn something from his dad. Never once did you give me even a goat. Because a he didn't understand who his dad was. See, Jesus hates sin. Now, when we're thinking about who God is, he hates sin. Why does he hate sin? Because sin kills us. You know, the wages of sin is, sin breaks us. God loves you. That's why he wants you to be free from sin. Absolutely, because he loves you. And sin kills. Sin separates us from God. Sin is not okay. It kills our marriages. It kills our self-esteem. It kills ourselves. Sin is not good for us. We, you know, back there in the garden, the enemy fed this lion to Eve that God is not letting you do this because he wants to limit you and he's the bit, you know, gigantic wet blanket that killed joy of eternity and he's still using that lion, but the opposite is true. We don't let our kids play with PowerPoints. Not if you're a good parent. Oh, touch this. Sin separates us from God. You know, it says everyone has sin. We all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Jesus doesn't want to just get you to heaven. He wants to get heaven into us. And so we, he doesn't just want to wipe away the penalty, which he does, but he wants to break the power of sin to break us. And he wants us to be able to walk free. Yesterday's behavior doesn't have to determine tomorrow's destiny. Jesus, you know, so sin keeps us from God and Jesus paid to get back to us. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his only son so everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. See, if the brother had under, older brother had understood who his dad was, he would know his dad was not a judger. He was a restorer. And we need to understand when we know God is a restorer. He's not a judger, which is great for all of us. And so because this, these, older, these religious leaders, this older brother, which was the religious leaders, didn't understand who God was. We need to understand. We've not just been forgiven. We are being, constantly being forgiven. <laughs> I reckon every thought that I have is full of humanity. The Bible says, definition of sin, fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, that means I'm never as good as God, right? Never. Okay, so therefore I need, I just need Jesus. Jesus, I need you. So we need to know who Jesus really is. He's come to love the world, to restore the world, to say, he's come to love your mates, restore your mates, heal your mates, transform us. He's a restorer. He's not come to judge us. That's not what he's about. He's come to restore us. Second thing is we need to love Jesus. We'll love what he loves. Um, when he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father, his father saw him coming and filled with love and compassion. I love that. Filled with love. And, so when God sees this broken, smelly, disgusting, dishonouring person come in who has just wasted half of his estate, he just feels, he's filled with love and compassion. And it, he ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I've sinned against you, both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father interrupts and says to his servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get the ring on his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf that has been fattening and we will celebrate with a feast. For the son of mine that was dead is now returned to life. He was lost and now he is found. You know, this is not about good or bad. This is about dead or alive. You know, when we're reaching out to our mates, this is not about good or bad. Oh, he's a good person. Not good enough. This is about dead or alive. See, this is, this is about eternity. God, how can I present you? How can I draw people towards what you want for them? You know, when the father saw his son come back, he would have been pretty disgusting. So he's been living with pigs. I had a friend whose dad used to, and I stayed with him for a couple of weeks, and he had a piggery, and pigs stink. When you put them inside in a piggery, it stinks. It's like strong ammonia. It's just like, whoa. And they used to wear different clothes every time they work. And they'd come back out and they'd hang up those overalls and they'd have a shower because you stink. And this guy's been with pigs eating pig food. He's stinking. And the older brother, when he saw his younger brother, he went, oh. But when the, son, when the father saw him, he went, oh. See, when Jesus sees people, he doesn't go, oh. He goes, oh. And he wants us to look at people and go, oh. 
Because Jesus loves people. He doesn't... Uh. You know, so many times in the Bible, Jesus sees the crowd and he has compassion over them because they're like sheep without a shepherd. One time, he's just found out his cousin's been killed by Herod. So he wants to go and have some alone time. So he just goes out to get some alone time. He just wants to spend some time with his disciples. He's just a little bit too much. He gets there. The crowd's got there before him. He sees this crowd and he's done. But he goes, oh, he's filled with compassion. You really don't understand Jesus when he looks at us. He's filled with compassion. Maybe today you think God's looking at you going, mm. no, he's looking at you going, oh, I love you so much. Oh, that's hurting you. Oh, can I carry that for you? Can I carry your sin? Can I connect you? Can I bring my life into your sin? If you could just let go of that habit, that would transform your life. Jesus is filled with compassion. The son said, I'm no longer worthy. Well, he was never worthy, just quietly. But the father just said, oh, my son is, was dead and now he's alive. When Jesus saw the crowd, when Jesus sees you, when Jesus sees your mates, your mates who've done all sorts of dodgy stuff, people who've hurt you, the people who've let you down, the people who've been nasty to you, his just breaks with compassion. We need to understand that we are loved and forgiven. And we are constantly being loved and forgiven. Jesus loves people. And the thing that breaks his heart and drove him to the cross was his need to be connected to us. In one way, God doesn't need anything, but evidently he needs us. He created us. He loves us. And he gave himself to connect with us. The best way to love Jesus is to love what he loves. The best way to love Jesus is to love what he loves. And you may know that I'm a grandfather. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. Um, I'm quite fond of that status and that activity. But you know what? Michaela, who's Samuel's wife, who I love very much, the best way to love her is to love Timothy. When I love Timothy, I just see her like, uh, she's just feeling loved. It's fantastic. So when we, we're called to know, we need to know who Jesus is, we need to love what he loves, and we need to be doing what he does. Um, there's a great book. I recommend it to you if you like reading books. It's from Tim Keller. Tim Keller's a genius. He writes this book called The Prodigal God. It's all about this prodigal son story. And he makes the point in this book called Prodigal God by Tim Keller. Write it down. Um, that someone went looking for the sheep. Someone went looking for the coin. But no one looked for the lost son. Yeah, that's a bit odd. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's a bit odd. The father didn't go looking for him. No one looked. The father was looking for him to come home, but never went out to find him. And so he makes the point, and I'll trust his scholarship, not mine, that the person who should have been out there looking for this lost son was the older brother. The older brother should have said, wow, my brother's lost. Am I my brother's keeper? That whole thing. I'm going to go look for my brother, and I'm going to bring him back, and I'm going to restore him. So... When the older brother says to his dad, all these years I've been slaving for you, but maybe not doing what his dad really needed him to do. And I think sometimes we can feel like, you know, God owes us a favour, but if we're not doing what Jesus is doing, we're not really loving him. And when you look at that story, the older brother was not slaving for his father, he was slaving for himself. He says, I'm doing this so I can get that from you. All these years I've been slaving for you and I never even got a jolly goat. And his dad's going, all the goats are yours. What is your problem? Just grab a goat. <laughs> but we can think, like, we're just trying to earn something from God. But the thing is, we're so far from earning something. This is, I was laughing with someone about this illustration. I've used it before. I used to do a bit of swimming. Mark Rungy does some swimming. He'd like me to do swimming with me. But I draw the line at getting into Lycra with Mark. I'm not getting into Speedos with Mark. Um, <laughs> Everyone's got to have your boundaries, and that's my boundary. It would be Mark, Rungy, and Ian Doropel. I don't want to see any of them in Speedos, just quietly. <laughs> and, um, but they go up and down, they post their achievements, and they do about one minute, 50-something per 100 metres or something, and they think that's pretty fantastic. But I, 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 went to, I used to go swimming at the Ocean Baths in Newcastle, and there was this big one It was, I think, a bit longer than 50 metres. It was long. But anyway, I just call it 50 metres and I decided I would compete against myself in the 1,500 metres and I discovered I was only 0.5 of an hour outside the world record. 
Point five of an hour, just point five. I reckon if I just worked on my turns, I could probably do that. Just make up that. I only have to make up point five. If I just worked on my turns, if I maybe just got my stroke a bit, maybe reached a bit more, I don't know what meant, what meant to do. All you do is just... It's the most boring thing in the world. But um, we come to God and we go, God, I'm, I'm just going to have a good day today. And he's, and he's, God, I had a good day today, Jesus. And he goes, well... Wasn't a lot different from yesterday, but I'm glad you're happy. Oh, Jesus, I had a terrible day today. Yeah, that wasn't much different from the day before. We're so far off the pace, people. We're not like good. This guy comes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what do I need to do to get to heaven? And Jesus goes, okay, let's define the terms. No one's good except God. So you need to be as good as God. How about we do that? He goes, oh, yeah, I am. And he goes, yeah, probably not. And then he just goes to the first commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul. How about you sell your stuff and come after me? He says, well, I can't do that. He says, yeah, okay. That's the real God. And he was really, but the story says Jesus looked at him and had felt genuine love for him. This rich, rich man who thought he had it together, Jesus felt genuine love for him because he wasn't there. And friends, we need to be doing what Jesus does. We need to be seeking and saving, looking for lost people. Uh, <laughs> Jesus walking along, sees Levi, who becomes Matthew, who wrote the book of Matthew. He's a tax collector. He's collecting tax. He says, how about you leave all that and come follow me? I don't know who looked after the money, but he leaves all that. And then he puts together a party of all his other tax collector mates and makes Jesus the guest of honour, and Jesus goes. And the Pharisees, unsurprisingly, are ticked off. And... Uh, and he says, look, I didn't come. The doctor comes for sick people. I come for people who know they need help. I come for those who know they are sinners and they need to repent. Church, we're on mission. And Jesus said, follow me. What he meant was follow me. Do what I do. Do what I do. Don't attend me. Don't adhere to me. Don't in some part of your brain believe that I'm true. Do what I do. That's what follow me means. You know, Jesus said to his boys at the end, you'll receive power and the Holy Spirit's come upon you. You're going to be witnesses to me here, there and everywhere because that's the point, one job. We need to live with our eyes up. Let's do this Christmas with eyes up, thinking about someone else. Because when we do that, it shows that we know who God is. We love what he loves and we want to do what he does. We need to know who God is, who he really is. He's not out there, the old, you know, smite the mighty smiter. No, he's, he's the God on the cross who gave his life to connect with your mates and your family because he loves people. We need to love what he loves because he loves people and we need to do what he does. You know, I'm astonished that Jesus came looking for me. I'm astonished that God wants to talk to me. I'm astonished that I can talk to God. I really am. I say that all the time, but it astonishes me all the time. And the more I read the Gospels, I'm reading the Gospels again this morning, and I'm going, seriously? You want to talk to me? You're a really impressive person. And you want to talk to me? It's, it's amazing to me that, that God loves me. And when he returned home, he said to his father, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming and filled with love and compassion. That's how Jesus feels about you. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus today, can I tell you, promise you, the Bible tells you, Jesus says, God is filled with love and compassion towards you. You think, yeah, but I've done some stuff. That's not the point. And he said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And you know, there's something powerful about knowing that we're not worthy and we need God. When we think we're worthy, we think we need nothing. And then we get into the place where we're pointing our finger at God, saying, God, you never gave me. And he says, I love you. I love you. And his father said, bring the finest robe. God wants to take off your stinking clothes that smell like the mistakes you've made, the sin you've committed. And he wanted to, it says, it's, it's always representative of his righteousness. I, I love it that when God looks at me, he sees his righteousness, not my compromise which is astonishing to me and the reason of that is because he died and paid the price for my failure and it says new robe new ring I get to be part of the family business doing what he does and new feet new new role I've got a new status and I've got a new role 
I'm a son and I do some things. I'm not a servant doing servant things. I'm a son who does some things. Jesus loves you. He, he came looking for you. He didn't need to step out of heaven. He wanted to step out of heaven. He didn't need to die. He wanted to die. He chose to die. He actually said, look, no one's pinching my life from me. No one's killing me. I'm laying my life down and I'm going to take it up again. But he's doing that so he could get to us. And what I would like us to do right now is just close our eyes. This just gives everyone a bit of privacy. And if today you're saying, I want to come back to my heavenly dad. I want to be restored. I'm sick of the pigs. I'm sick of feeling like I'm separated from him. I'm sick of the... the Sin's killing me. I want to come back to God. I want to come back to my Father. I want to receive His forgiveness. I want to do life in His house rather than this pig pen. I just want you to put your hand up and say, that's me. I'm coming back to Jesus today. I see your hand there, champion. Who else this morning said, yeah, that's me. I want to say yes to Jesus today. I see your hand there, champion. That's fantastic. Who else this morning saying, I'm coming back to the boss. I'm coming back and I'm saying, I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. Just stick your hand up and say, yeah, I mean, really what you're doing is giving heaven a wave. Saying, Jesus, pick me. He's already picked you. But you're saying, Jesus, I'm in. I'm in. Fantastic. Who else this morning saying, yeah, that's me. Today I'm coming into a relationship with Jesus. I'm surrendering my life to Jesus. I'm, after, I'm asking Jesus to forgive my sin today. I want that new robe. I'm putting on that new ring of that family status and I'm putting on those new shoes of serving Jesus. Just give me a wave. One last chance. See your hand there. That's fantastic. See your hand there. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. Awesome. Let's stand together, church. I love this. We're going to pray together, a simple conversation with God, really asking Him, thanking Him for His forgiveness, and just surrendering our life to Him. Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus. This is my decision to put you first in my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying in my place. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for forgiving my failure. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for healing my life. Thank you for accepting me, Jesus. Today, Lord Jesus, I'm surrendering my life to you. Amen. Amen. Fantastic. Hey, um, we've got the Next Steps Lounge out there in the foyer. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to talk to you about your next step in following Jesus. You know, like I always say, Jesus doesn't just call us to an encounter with Him. He called us to a relationship with Him, to walk with Him through life. And we'd love to talk with you today about your next step in following Jesus. If you need a Bible, we'd love to give you a Bible. Well, thanks so much for connecting in today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus, whether that's for the first time or a reconnection with him, we would love to partner with you and help encourage you along that journey. So we've got a QR code here where you can let us know your details so that we can reach out and really just come alongside you and champion you. We want to support you and everything that you've got in taking your next step. Uh, so if it's maybe you said yes to Jesus, or there might be another step that you've got in mind for your Christian journey, that QR code is the place to go where we can come alongside you. That's awesome. Hey, we pray that you have a great week. We would love to welcome you in one of our locations, Brisbane South, Brisbane North or Central Queensland. So reach out to us, we'll save you a seat. We'll have a coffee waiting for you. We can't wait to meet you, but have a fantastic week, church.